As a committed lifelong Mopar guy, I'll be the first to admit I'm more than a little jealous of the whole LS scene. You know, what you guys got going on, it's amazing. You, you never before has so much ridiculous horsepower been available to so many people for so cheap. You know, a thousand horsepower today is nothing. Just, you know, it, people throw around these numbers like, you know, we used to throw around 400 horsepower, 500 horsepower. You guys are up over a thousand, you know. And the legend of the LS is really built on what it does with power adders. So it's the junkyard LS, you know, a couple of, you know, cheap turbos, eBay turbos, or, or a big shot of spray, and, you know, boof, there's your 900,000, 1100 horsepower. And these things live. But the thing about this is that, and I'm not, I'm not taking anything away from the LS at all. It's, an, it's, it's, a, it's probably like the most evolved, perfect design passenger car engine ever. So I'm not taking anything away from the LS. But the characteristics of a junkyard engine in general are what makes these things perfect for boost. Um, so let, let's go back. Let's, let's go to like early, early history, right? In the earliest days of top fuel, it was very common for uh, uh, the budget guys to go to the junkyard, pick up a 354, 392. They'd bring it back to the shop, drop the oil pan, clean out the sludge. They would throw a cam in the thing, they would put the blower on top, their injection, and then boom, send it. So what they were doing is they were running, they were making 1,000, 1,200 horsepower out of these junkyard motors. And they would get 50, 60, 70 passes out of the things before it would finally give up and throw the crankshaft on the ground. In that era, those engines ran toe-to-toe -to -toe with ones that were built by professionals with all of the best parts money you could buy back in the day. Now, if you go forward a couple more years, you go to like the, the middle to late 60s when junior fuel became a thing. And budget racers were doing the same thing with the small block Chevys. They were taking the 283 Chevys, so they had a 305 cubic inch limit at that point. So they were taking three, 283 Chevys, and same thing. They pull them out of the junkyard, they, they, they put a set of injectors on a cam, set of injectors, and just send it. In fact, I remember reading a story about this, uh, and I think it was Drag Racing USA Magazine, where one of the guys talked about the, the failure point of those engines was the oil filter cartridge, because the paint the, uh, that they used, that said AC Delco, on the cartridge would come off with the nitro, would dilute it, and it would get down or clog the, uh, the oil pickup. But on that, those engines were stuck. And again, they were dancing around the 200 mile an hour range, right up there around 1,000 horsepower. Stock engines. So what is it about a junkyard motor, right, that allows it to kind of like defy the laws of hot rodding and make ridiculous power with, you know, no internal modifications and, and live doing it. There are three things, right? There are three factors. Um, and this could be applied pretty much across the board to any engine, but you need something that was that's of sound engineering to begin with. Like you couldn't just take a, you know, a, a half S type engine and do this with. It has to be something that's built from the factory, right? Built well from the factory, has good geometry, you know, good sealing characteristics like the LS, like the small block Chevy, like the Hemi before it. Three factors that make a junkyard engine perfect for boost, right? The first is seasoning. When you take an engine that's had, that's, that's had, let's say 10, 12, 15 years worth of heating and cooling cycles, it's called seasoning. It means that the parts have all expanded and contracted together countless times, and they're happy together. Uh, any movement, any, any, uh, any stresses that are in those castings or in the assembly are all worked out. In fact, in the old days, it used to be common, uh, if you visit an engine shop, you know, an engine builder, there would be a stack of blocks out behind the shop, and they would just be exposed to the weather, and they were seasoning those blocks. They'd sit there for a year or two and just go through freezing and cooling, they'd be caked in ice, and then they'd bake in the sun, and that was all part of the seasoning process. And back in those days, like something like a taxi cab engine was like prized. You know, if you were building, let's say, a small block Chevy and you scored one out of a taxi cab, you're good to go because this thing's got 400, 500,000 miles on it. And it's like, it's happy. You can do this thing, any machine work on it, and it's going to stay. You know it. So seasoning is the first cap, is the first, you know, I would say major uh, factor in favor of a junkyard motor. 
Then in the in the piston and rod assembly, okay. Um, the biggest problem, if you take a stock engine, um, stock clearances with a tight upper tight ring gaps, what happens is when you cross a threshold of around five to six hundred horsepower, cylinder temperatures get up high enough that those rings expand beyond. See, okay, when the, when the manufacturer sets the gap on the ring, the intention is, let's say it's a, it's a 12,000 seven inch gap, just pull a number out of my ass. They're calculating that at the, the, the height of the piston, you know, compared, you know, the height of the ring compared to the top of the piston, um, the overall characteristics of the engine, that this ring is gonna heat up to the point that when it's at operating temperature, that gap is gonna close up to almost zero. So now what happens is when you start really leaning on an engine, that gap closes beyond zero. So in other words, the ends of the ring butt together and the ring will buckle. And when the ring buckles, that's when pistons fail. In fact, that's the weak link of cast pistons. It's not so much the piston itself, the construction of the piston. It's the fact that they're usually used with stock rings and stock gaps. So when you spray this thing or you boost it and you're starting to really make power with the thing, that when those when those gaps close up, that ring's got no place to go except to buckle. And when it buckles, it spreads apart the ring land, and that's it. Crack, gone, she's over. The, as long as you tune up, just like the old days at the top fuel cars, as long as you're staying out of detonation and your tune up is fat enough to keep the surface area of the piston cool, you can make ridiculous power with a stock cast piston. But a junkyard engine because it's got two, three hundred thousand miles of wear, you know, usually stop and go driving, maybe a little neglectful oil changes every 10,000 miles. Those rings are worn. So what would normally be a 15,000th gap is now a 30,000th gap. And that gap makes the difference when you start pushing power through this thing. That ring gets, gets hot, it expands, but it doesn't buckle and it won't break the piston. So there's like number two in, in favor of a junkyard motor. The third is down underneath in the bearings. When you start making real horsepower in an engine, again, you, you, you get past that 500 horsepower, 600 horsepower range, and you're starting to make some real horsepower. Things move around. The block flexes, the rods flex a little bit, the pistons will cock a little in the bore. All sorts of things happen. And if you, if an, if you have an engine with tight clearances, tight oil, you know, bearing clearances between the bearing and the, and the crankshaft, if you have an engine with tight clearances, when that happens, when that normal distortion happens, well, normal, you know, normal high horsepower distortion happens, the bearing will grab the journal, it'll spin, it's gone. When you're dealing with a, a, a two, three hundred thousand mile junkyard engine, those bearings are worn. Where you would normally have, let's say, one and a half to two thousands oil clearance, now you're at the three thousands oil clearance. And that makes a difference when things start flexing and getting serious. So. Again, see, today the LS is the engine of choice. And the thing about the LS is that it came about in the age of the cheap power adder. So the junkyard LS and the cheap air power adder kind of just combined to make this perfect, you know, low budget horsepower making machine. But that's why. Will they ever build one? No. I mean, if somebody brings me, you know, an LS and a bunch of money and says, here, put this thing together, let's, let's go make smoke, I'm all about it, you know, it looks like a fun thing. But uh, I just think, let me just throw that out there and let you guys know exactly what it is. It's not voodoo, you know, uh, there's nothing specifically special about the LS that allows this to happen other than it's a very well constructed engine. The, um, the voodoo is just where it's just, it's just everything's happy. That's what makes it happen. That's what makes horsepower. See you tomorrow.